pretty. All right, sorry about that for all of you guys that are on live stream. Um, I did not see and notice Miranda's hand to try to get me to correct that. Let me see, video on YouTube and Facebook. It looks like it's showing me that I have video on Facebook and YouTube, but um, there, it may not be happening in all situations. So hopefully what I just did will it's working out, sir. Okay, perfect. Thank you guys for letting me know that. I, I didn't notice you guys uh, trying to alert me to that. I apologize. All right, so I'll turn things over to you guys for any questions uh, related to what I just shared. It seems that Rick has a question. Let's go to him, sir. All right. Hi. Um... I was just wondering why an eon. It's a very, very long time. And I was just wondering uh, what the significance of that is. Yeah, I should have mentioned an eon is an incalculable amount of time. And you're going to see some uh, chapters in the Buddhist teachings about how he talks about how long an eon is. And he basically says it's immeasurable and incalculable. Um, so oftentimes when there's ver something very significant that somebody's doing the buddha will share that somebody is you know doomed to this realm of hell for an eon or even countless eons he talks about in some situations you know multiple eons um why that long you know i don't know um but the buddha is basically saying this person's going to hell for an uh, an enormous amount of time um, and we've got some similes today where he talks about how long uh, some of you know this this is and kind of helps you to see just how uh, significant and how long it is. Does he ever say in any of the other literature why it takes such a long time to um, to build new karma? Um, I know that when we he talks about the hell realm, you know, he talks about how painful the feelings are in that realm and how difficult it is. You're going to get some teachings today where he talks about some of the things that are going on in the hell realm. And uh, those beings just really are so burdened with painful feelings and having so many harmful things happening that there's just no uh, time. You know, there's very uh, minimal time to be able to cultivate the mind to get to improve uh, outside of uh, getting out of the hell realm but of course those beings will ultimately get out of the hell realm because they're not it's not a permanent place to exist but there's just really not much else going on there but a lot of painful things thank you teacher david yeah you're welcome it seems there are no other questions at this time sir all right so we'll move on to the next one. A lot of what we're going to be discussing today is about hell because this book goes from the hell realm to animal realm to afflicted spirits, human and heavenly realm. So we're going to be talking a lot about hell today. <laughs> and I guess it's pretty um, fitting because I'm in an area of New York called Hell's Kitchen. <laughs> uh, let's go to... Should we read chapter 22, sir? All right. Okay. Chapter 22. <laughs> Simile for the suffering in hell. Monks, there are these three characteristics of an unwise person, signs of an unwise person, attributes of an unwise person. But three, here an unwise person is one who thinks unwholesome thoughts speaks unwholesome words, and does unwholesome actions. If an unwise person were not so, how would the wise know him thus? This person is an unwise person, an untrue man. But because, a, because an unwise person is one who thinks unwholesome thoughts, speaks unwholesome words, and does unwholesome actions, the wise know him thus. This person is unwise, an untrue man. An unwise person feels pain and grief here and now in three ways. 
If an unwise person is seated in an assembly or along a street or in a square and people there are discussing certain pertinent and relevant matters, then if the unwise person is one who kills living beings, takes what is not given, misconducts himself in sensual pleasures, speaks falsehood, and indulges in wine, liquor, and intoxicants, which are substances that cause heedlessness, which are the basis of heedlessness, he thinks, these people are discussing certain pertinent and relevant matters. These things are found in me, and I am seen engaging in those things. This is the first kind of pain and grief that is an unwise person feel, that an unwise person feels here and now. Again, when a robber culprit is caught, an unwise person sees kings having many kinds of torture inflicted on him, having him flogged with whips, beaten with canes, beaten with clubs, having his hands cut off, his feet cut off, his hands and feet cut off, his ears cut off, his nose cut off, his ears and nose cut off, and having him subjected to the porridge pot, to the polished shelf shave, to the Rahu's mouth, to the fiery wreath, to the flaming hands, to the blades of grass, to the bark dress, to the antelope, to the meat hooks, to the coins, to the lye picking, pickling, to the pivoting pin, to the rolled up palias, and having him splashed with boiling oil, and having him thrown to be devoured by dogs, and having him impaled alive on stakes, and having his head cut off with the sword. Then the unwise person thinks thus, because of such evil, evil, which are unwholesome actions as those, when a robber culprit is caught, kings have many kinds of tortures inflicted on him. They have him flogged with whips and have his head cut off with the sword. Those things are found in me, and I am seen engaging in those things. This is the second kind of pain and grief that an unwise person feels here and now. Again, when an unwise person is on his chair, on his bed, or resting on the ground, then the evil or unwholesome actions that he did in the past, his bodily, verbal, and mental misconduct, cover him, overspread him, and envelop him. Just as the shadow of a great mountain peak in the evening covers, overspreads, and envelops the earth, so too, when an unwise person is on his chair, or on his bed, or resting on the ground, then the evil, unwholesome actions that he did in the past, his bodily, verbal, and mental misconduct, cover him, overspread him, and envelop him. <clears throat> then the unwise person thinks, I have not done what is good. I have not done what is wholesome. I have not made myself a shelter from anguish. I have done what is evil, unwholesome. I have done what is cruel. I have done what is wicked. When I pass away, I shall go to the destination of those who have not done what is good, who have done what is wicked. He sorrows, grieves, and has displeasure. He cries, beating his breast, and becomes distraught. This is the third kind of pain and grief that an unwise person feels here and now. An unwise person who has given himself over to misconduct of body, speech, and mind, on the dissolution of the body after death, reappears in a state without basic necessities in an unhappy destination, even in hell. Were it rightly speaking to be said of anything, that is utterly that is unwished for, utterly undesired, utterly disagreeable. It is of hell that, rightly speaking, this should be said, so much so that it is hard to find a simile for the suffering in hell. But, venerable sir, can a simile be given? It can, monk, the perfectly enlightened one said. Monks, suppose men caught a robber culprit and presented him to the king, saying, Here is a robber culprit. Order what punishment you will for him. Then the king said, Go and strike this man in the morning with a hundred spears. And they struck him in the morning with a hundred spears. Then at noon, the king asked, How is that man? Sir, he is still alive. Then the king said, Go and strike that man at noon with a hundred spears. And they struck him at noon with a hundred spears. Then in the evening, the king asked, How is that man? Sir, he is still alive. Then the king said, 
go and strike that man in the evening with a hundred spears. And they struck him in the evening with a hundred spears. What do you think, Mux? Would that man experience pain and grief because of being struck with the 300 spears? Venerable sir, that man would experience pain and grief because of being struck with even one spear, let alone 300. Then, taking a small stone the size of his hand, the perfectly enlightened one addressed the monks thus. What do you think, monks? Which is the greater, this small stone that I have taken, the size of my hand, or Himalaya, the king of mountains? Venerable sir, the small stone that the perfectly enlightened one has taken is um, the size of his hand is insignificant. Besides Himalaya, the king of mountains, it is not even a fraction. There is no comparison. So too, monks, the pain and grief that the man would experience because of being struck with the 300 spears does not count besides the suffering of hell. It is not even a fraction. There is no comparison. The law of the three seals, one, parge pot, is smashing the skull open, peeling off the scalp, putting a blazing iron inside the tongue in order to burst the brain out like over boiling pot. Two, polished shell shave, is cutting and pulling out the strips of skin from the marked two points at the upper lips to the marked two points at the top of the ears continuing to the mark two points in the back of the head and twisting all pieces of skin to tie a knot together with paint with hair. Two people would insert a stick inside the knot, stir up, shake and tear off all the skin, the scalp and the hair. Then they will polish the skull and coarse with coarse sand and make it shine as white as a polished shell. Three. Rahu's mouth is widening up the mouth with hooks and setting up a continuous fire inside. Another method is tearing apart the lips through the tops of the ears with a sharp chisel, keeping the mouth wide open with hooks and letting it fill up with blood. Fiery wreath is wrapping up the whole body with an oil-soaked cloth and setting it on fire. Five. Flaming hand is wrapping around the ten fingers with oil-soaked cloths and setting them on fire. Six, blades of grass is cutting flesh with severe unbroken strips bound with skin from the neck base all the way down to the ankles, then trying the flesh strip, strip, strips with rope, forcing and hitting one to walk over his own strips of meat, meat until death. Seven, bark dress is cutting flesh into strips from neck base to waist and from waist to ankles, letting the flesh strips hang down just as one is wearing at a great at a wearing a grassy garment. Eight, antelope is firmly putting the steel rings on both elbows and both knees, inserting the steel stakes inside those rings, and fixing the stakes to the ground in order to prevent all body movements and setting a ring of fire around death. Nine, meat hook is striking the double sharp edge hooks into the body pulling out small and large pieces of flesh and tendons out until death. 10. Coins is slicing bits of flesh at the weight of a tumlong, letting those pieces fall from the body and continuing to cut until running out of meat. 11. Lie picking is slicing, chopping, cutting the whole body and scraping out all the small and large meat and tendons with acid-soaked brush, leaving only the remains of skeleton. Pivoting pin is making one lie on one side, hammering down a steel spear through both ear holes in order to tie one tightly down to the ground, then spinning one around by grabbing both feet like a person whirling. Rolling up palius is crushing down the bone into powder with millstones without tearing off flesh and tendons, seizing hair, folding skin and bone together in one mass, then lifting up, lowering it down to make a round pile, subsequently placing it down as a foot wiping mat. 14. Splashed into boiling oil is stirring up the fiercely boiling oil and pouring it on the body from the head down until death. 15. Thrown to be devoured by dogs is confining the ferocious dogs, starving them to the fullest extent for several days then letting them out to devour the flesh and skin to the remains of skeletons. 
All right. Thank that you. That was brutal. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Rick, for, for agreeing to read that. Um, as you see here, the Buddha is describing some very uh, detail, very specific details about the realm of hell. And the way that the Buddha understood these things is because he talked about experiencing existences in all these different realms. So <clears throat> as we talk about these various realms being impermanent and that beings are born in and out of these various realms, even a Buddha who actually became a Buddha, he experienced hell and he experienced all the different things that you're reading and that you're learning during previous existences. So that shows you that even someone who ultimately becomes a Buddha has in the past experienced these different horrible things and that we can ascend beyond them. You know, we don't need to be plagued by these things. But what a Buddha's goal is, is that now that they have such recall of all these horrific things that ex they experienced in their previous lives, as well as this life themselves, that when they're an actual Buddha, they would have had to gone through a tremendous amount of work and effort in order to get to enlightenment on their own without the help of anyone else. That's just a very difficult uh, way of attaining enlightenment that a Buddha would have transcended and gotten to enlightenment that they're not interested in anyone else having to experience that and a Buddha knowing that they've attained enlightenment on their own and all that went into doing that in this life and what they've experienced in their past lives they now dedicate the rest of their life to sharing the teachings such that other beings can avoid all these difficulties and struggles that they experienced in this life and previous lives. So by giving this really descriptive uh, re re recounting of what he experienced in this uh, hell realm, it can potentially help others to avoid uh, getting into that hell realm. And the teachings that the Buddha shares during his lifetime are to help people to avoid rebirth at all but particularly rebirth in lower realm but of course there's people who aren't going to learn the teachings of a buddha during the lifetime of a buddha so they are going to experience these things and perhaps you might have experienced these things in the past as well so when we read the buddhist teachings it's important to understand that if you've been part of a tradition where things about these lower realms have been shared in order to guilt shame or fear somebody into learning and practicing their teachings that's not the way that a buddha functions instead they're sharing the teachings with loving kindness and compassion with the entire world helping individuals to move beyond what they experience uh, in the difficulties that they're experiencing in this life and previous lives as well as a way to guide you and help you to not experience those things ever again so the Buddha here is explaining at the very beginning of the simile that an unwise person is one who has unwholesome thoughts, speaks unwholesome words, and does unwholesome actions. Well, all of us have done those things uh, in the past, and maybe you're even doing those things now. The Buddha himself you know, did those things in the past as well. So this isn't about judging somebody that they are now doomed to hell. It's about, okay, recognizing that, yes, if I have unwholesome thoughts, if I speak unwholesome words, and I have unwholesome actions, then yes, I'm an unwise person. I don't have the wisdom yet of how to cultivate the mind to get to a point where I only have exclusively wholesome thoughts, where I have exclusively wholesome words and practicing right speech and the five factors of well-spoken speech. And I don't currently have completely wholesome actions. So if you're lacking the wisdom of how to do that, then that's what the Buddha is actually sharing with you. It's not that you're a bad person or you're doomed to hell at this point. It's about, okay, now that you recognize that you have unwholesome thoughts, words, and actions, now learn and practice in a way that you can improve that. And then you can see the condition of the mind gradually improve. So the Buddha talks about three ways that an unwise person is going to essentially suffer in this life uh, right now. And this isn't the only three, but these are three ways that someone is going to have difficulties in this life. The first one he talks about is if this person is around others who are discussing what we would refer to as the five precepts of one who kills, steals, has sexual misconduct, speaks falsehood and indulges in substances that cause heedlessness, then if you hear people talking about those things and you do those things currently, then 
as an unwise person, you'll feel pain and grief, uh, you know, right now, essentially, because you're hearing people talk about these things that are unwholesome and unwise, and yet you know that those things are part of your practice now. So you're going to experience a certain amount of pain and grief around that. And then the Buddha talks about uh, a, a person who is essentially a criminal who's caught, and then they essentially get this torture. And of course, you know, we don't really have places that do this kind of thing so much today. Um, but the way that you can relate this is that, you know, if you hear about a criminal who gets arrested for certain things and they get a certain punishment of going to jail for six months or six years or 60 years or what have you, then when you hear those things on the news or you hear them from a friend and you're like, oh my goodness, I do those things. Now your mind is going to experience this grief and this pain because you know that those things are something that's potentially uh, can come to you. You might actually feel those that pain and grief because you're doing those same things as that person who got a certain penalty of going to jail or a certain financial penalty or what have you, and you're going to experience this pain and grief. Um, and then the Buddha talks about this third aspect is that um, where when you are just, if you're doing unwholesome things through thoughts and speech and actions, and you're just sitting somewhere, say on your bed or in a chair, and you're just kind of thinking over your life about things that you've done in the past, the Buddha is talking about how this kind of shadow of darkness kind of over envelops you, um, where this unwise person thinks, you know, I, I've not done what is good. You know, I've done these unwholesome things, essentially. And the Buddha is explaining how at that time you might be very um, scared or very fearful, essentially, is what he's describing, that thinking that when I pass away or when I die, that there's going to be this unwholesome results where these uh, I'm going to experience this unfortunate rebirth in these unfortunate situation like being in hell or the animal realm or afflicted spirits so the buddha is saying that in that situation where you're reflecting on your life and thinking about the things that you've done there's going to be this sorrow and grief and displeasure that comes over the mind thinking about the unwholesome things that you've done so these are ways that we kind of punish ourselves, that we punish ourselves by doing having unwholesome thoughts, unwholesome speech, and unwholesome actions, that these things kind of envelop our mind, and we have this sorrow and this grief and this displeasure as a result. And the goal would be to now clean up your moral conduct and your mental discipline through acquiring wisdom of these teachings so that then you won't have these problems, you won't have these difficulties, that when you hear other people talking about the five precepts, for example, or any aspect of those, uh, you thinking, okay, yes, yeah, that's very wise. That's a, a good way to conduct yourself. Or if you see criminals going to jail or having certain penalties, you know, that's unfortunate that that's happening for them, but you understand that that's their decision. That's the results of their decisions. And you're choosing to not make those decisions. So you don't have to be worried or fearful that those things are going to happen to you because you no longer do those unwholesome things. Or when you're sitting alone and you're just reflecting on your life and you look back over the last one year, two years, three years, however long you're actively working to practice these teachings, you can be resting assured that you're doing wholesome things. You don't have to be worried about this shadow of darkness following you because of the unwholesome things that you're doing. So the Buddha is helping you to see that you can clean this up and not incur this sorrow, this grief, and this displeasure as a result. And then he goes into explaining the type of pain and the type of experiences that one would experience as a result of being in hell if they continue to have unwholesome thoughts, speech, and actions. And there's rebirth in hell. The Buddha gives this simile explaining the pain of these 300 spears that would be experienced in just one of those spears would incur all types of pain, as his students explain. But the Buddha explains that, you know, it's like getting these 300 spears. And then he talks about this uh, stone. And uh, this stone is very small, but yet this mountain is very large. And how the grief and the pain experienced because of being struck with these uh, 300 spears is essentially the equivalent of uh, this, you know, 
uh, or, or actually is just a fraction, sorry, that these 300 spears are just a fraction of the pain and the misery that's experienced in hell. And then he gives a very detailed account of the things that are occurring in the realm of hell. And he goes through all 14 of those, or 15. What questions do you guys have on this chapter? It does not appear there are any questions at this time, sir. Okay. So the way you can use these chapters is you can use them you know, as motivation for yourself, if that's the way you like to, to use it. So chapter 23. Um, yes, sir. Let's go to Jan to read the first half of chapter 23. Thanks. Thank you, Miranda. Um, please let me know if you can't hear me well. I'm sitting outside. I'll try to keep my voice raised. Thank you. Many kinds of tortures inflicted on those who do evil, unwholesome actions. Monks, suppose there were two houses with doors and a man with good sight standing there between them saw people going in and coming out and passing to and from. So too with the divine eye, third eye, which is purified and surpasses the human, I see beings passing away and reappearing, unwholesome and wholesome, fair and ugly, fortunate and unfortunate. I understand how beings pass on according to their actions thus. Those worthy beings who were well conducted in body, speech, and mind, not abusive of noble ones, right in their Looks like Jan's internet might have frozen up. Worthy beings who were well conducted in body, speech, and mind, not abusive of noble ones, right in their views, giving effect to right views in their actions, on the dissolution of the body after death, have reappeared among human beings. But these worthy beings who were ill conducted in body, speech, and mind, abusive of noble ones, wrong in their views, giving effect to wrong views in their actions on the dissolution of the body after death have reappeared in the realm of afflicted spirits. Or these worthy beings who were ill-conducted in body, speech, and mind, abusive of noble ones, wrong in their views, giving effect to wrong views in their actions on the dissolution of the body after death have reappeared in the animal world. Or these worthy beings who were ill-conducted in body, speech, and mind, abusive of noble ones, wrong in their views, giving effect to wrong views in their actions, on the dissolution of the body after death, have reappeared in a state without basic necessities, an unhappy destination, in perdition, even in hell. Now the wardens of hell seize such a being by the arms, and present him to King Yama, saying, Sir, this man has ill-treated his mother, ill-treated his father, ill-treated ascetics, ill-treated Brahmins. He has had no respect for the elders of his clan. Let the king order his punishment. Then King Yama presses and questions and cross-questions him about the first divine messenger. <coughs> Good man, did you not see the first divine messenger to appear in the world? He says, I did not, venerable sir. Then King Yama says, good man, have you, you never seen in the world a young tender infant lying prone, fouled in his own excrement and urine? He says, I have, venerable sir. Then King Yama says, good man, did it never occur to you, an intelligent and mature man, that I too am subject to birth? I am not exempt from birth. Surely I had better do good by body, speech, and mind. He says, I was unable, venerable sir, I was complacent. Then King Yama says, good man, through complacency, you have failed to do good by body, speech, and mind. Certainly they will deal with you according to your complacency. But this evil, unwholesome action of yours was not done by your mother or your father or your brother or your sister or by your friends and companions or by your kinsmen and relatives or by ascetics and Brahmins, or by gods. This evil and wholesome action was done by you yourself, and you yourself will experience its result. Then after pressing and questioning and cross-questioning him about the first divine messenger, 
King Yama presses and questions and cross questions him about the second divine messenger. Good man, did you not see the second divine messenger to appear in the world? He says, I did not, venerable sir. King Yama says, good man, have you never seen in the world a man or a woman at 80, 90, or 100 years age as crooked as a roof bracket, doubled up, supported by a walking stick, unsteady, weak, youth gone, teeth broken, gray-haired, scanty-haired, bald, wrinkled, with limbs all blotchy? He says, I have, venerable sir. Then King Yama says, good man, did it never occur to you, an intelligent and mature man, that I am, I too am subject to aging. I am not exempt from aging. Surely I had better do good by body, speech, and mind. He says, I was unable, venerable sir, I was complacent. Then King Yama says, good man, through complacency, you have failed to do good by body, speech, and mind. Certainly they will deal with you according to your complacency. But this evil, unwholesome action of yours was not done by your mother or your father or by your brother or your sister or by your friends and companions or by your kinsmen and relatives or by ascetics and Brahmins or by gods. This evil, unwholesome action was done by you yourself and you yourself will experience its result. Then. After pressing and questioning and cross-questioning him about the second divine messenger, King Yama presses and questions and cross-questions him about the third divine messenger. Good man, did you not see the third divine messenger to appear in the world? He says, I did not, venerable sir. Then King Yama says, good man, have you never seen in the world a man or a woman afflicted, suffering and gravely ill, lying fouled in his own excrement and urine? lifted up by some and set down by others, says, I have venerable sir. Then King Yama says, good man, did it never occur to you, an intelligent and mature man, I too am subject to sickness. I am not exempt from sickness. Surely I had better do good by body, speech and mind. He says, I was unable venerable sir, I was complacent. Then King Yama says, good man, through complacency, you have failed to do good by body, speech, and mind. Certainly they will deal with you according to your complacency. But this evil and wholesome action of yours was not done by your mother or your father or by your brother or your sister or by your friends and companions or by your kinsmen and relatives or by ascetics and Brahmins or by gods. This evil and wholesome action was done by you yourself and you yourself will experience its result. Then, after pressing and questioning and cross-questioning him about the third divine messenger, King Yama presses and questions and cross-questions him about the fourth divine messenger. Good man, did you not see the fourth divine messenger to appear in the world? He says, I did not, venerable sir. Then King Yama says, good man, have you never seen in the world when a robber culprit is caught, kings having many kind of tortures inflicted on him? having him flogged with whips, beaten with canes, beaten with clubs, having his hands cut off, his feet cut off, his hands and feet cut off, his ears cut off, his nose cut off, his ears and nose cut off, having him subjected to the porridge pot, to the spot polished shell shave, to the Rahu's mouth, to the fiery wreath, to the flaming hand, to the blades of grass, to the bark dress, to the antelope, to the meat hooks, to the coins, to the live pickle, pickling, to the pivoting pin, to the rolled up palace, and having him splashed with boiling oil, and having him thrown to be devoured by dogs, and having him impaled alive on stakes, and having his head cut off with a sword. He says, I have, venerable sir. Then King Yama says, good man, did it never occur to you, an intelligent and mature man, those who do evil, unwholesome acts, actions, have such tortures of various kinds inflicted on them here and now. So what in the hereafter? Surely I had better do good by body, speech, and mind. He says, I was unable, venerable sir. I was complacent. Then King Yama says, good man, through complacency, you have failed to do good by body, speech, and mind. Certainly they will deal with you according to your complacency. But this evil and wholesome action of yours was not done 
by your mother or your father or by your brother or your sister or by your friends and companions or by your kinsmen and relatives or by ascetics and Brahmins or by gods. This evil and wholesome action was done by you yourself and you yourself will experience its result. Then after pressing and questioning and cross questioning him about the fourth divine messenger, King Yama presses and questions and cross questions him about the fifth divine messenger. Good man, did you not see the fifth divine messenger to appear in the world? He says, I did not venerable sir. Then King Yama says, good man, have you never seen in the world a man or a woman, one day dead, two days dead, three days dead, bloated, living and oozing with matter? I, I'm not Sweet. sure if this is the fourth one and Donnie now will read. Yes, let's go to Donnie to read the rest of this chapter, please. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Remenda. He says, I have, venerable sir. Then King Yama says, good man, it never occurred to you, an intelligent and mature man. I too am subject to death. I am not exempt from death. Surely I had better do good by body, speech and mind. He says, I was unable, vulnerable sir. I was complacent. Then King Yama says, good man, through complacency, you have failed to do good by body, speech and mind. Certainly they will deal with you according to your complacency. But this evil and wholesome action of yours was not done by your mother, father, brother, sister, friends, companions, kinsmen, relatives, aesthetics, Brahmins, or by gods. This evil and wholesome action was done by you yourself, and you yourself will experience these actions. Results. Then after pressing and questioning and cross-exam, questioning him about the fifth divine messenger, King Yaman is silent. Now, the waters of hell torture him with the fivefold transfixing. To drive a red hot iron stake through one hand, drive a red hot iron stake through the other hand. They drive a red hot iron stake through one foot. They drive a red hot iron stake through the other foot. They drive a red hot iron stake in the middle of his breast. There he feels painful, agonizing, piercing feelings. Yet he does not die so long as the evil and wholesome action has not exhausted its results. Next, the waters of hell throw him down and pair him with excess. There, he feels a painful, agonizing, piercing feelings, yet he does not die. As so long as that evil and wholesome action has not exhausted its results. Next, the waters of hell set him with his feet up and his head down and pair him with others. There, he feels painful, agonizing, piercing feelings. Yet he does not die so long as the evil and wholesome action has not exhausted its results. Next, the waters of hell arrests him to a chariot and drive him back and forth across ground that is burning, blazing, and glowing. There he feels painful, agonizing, piercing feelings, yet he does not die so long as the evil and wholesome action has not exhausted its results. Next, the waters of hell make him climb up and down a great mound of coals that are burning, blazing and glowing. There he feels painful, agonizing, pain, piercing feelings, yet he does not die so long as the evil and wholesome action has not exhausted its result. Next, the waters of hell take him feet up and head down and plunge him into a great hot metal cauldron that is burning, blazing and glowing. He is cooked there in a swirl of froth. And as he is being cooked, there is there in the swirl of froth, he is swept now up, now down, and now across. There he feels painful, agonizing, piercing feelings, yet he does not die so long as the evil and wholesome action has not exhausted his result. Next, the waters of hell throw him into the great hell. Now as to that great hell, monks, it has four corners and is filled with four doors, one set on in each side, worn out with iron all around and shut in with an iron roof. His floor is as well is made of iron and heated until it glows with fire. The range is a full hundred leagues which it covers all pers pervasively. Now the flames that search from the Great Hell's eastern wall dash against its western wall. The flames that search from its western wall dash across its eastern wall. 
the flames that surge from its northern wall dash across its southern wall, flames that surge from its southern wall dash against its northern wall, the flames that dash out from the bottom dash against the top, and the flames that surge out from the top dash against the bottom. There he feels painful, agonizing, piercing feelings, yet does not die so long as that evil, unwholesome action has not exhausted his result. Sometime or another, monks, at the end of a long period, there comes an occasion where the great hell's eastern door is open. He runs towards it, treading quickly, and he does so, his outer skin burns, his inner skin burns, his flesh burns, his sinews burn, his bones turn to smoke, and it is the same when his feet is uplifted. When at long last he reaches the door, then it is shut. There he feels painful, agonizing, piercing feelings, yet he does not die so long as that evil, unwholesome action has not exhausted his result. Some time or other, at the end of a long period, there comes an occasion where the great hell's western door is open, when its northern door is open, when its southern door is open. He runs towards it, treading quickly, when at long last he reaches the door, then it is shut. There he feels painful, agonizing, pain, piercing feelings, yet he does not die so long as that evil, unwholesome action has not exhausted his result. <clears throat> Sometime or other monks, at the end of a long period, there comes an occasion where the great house eastern door is open. He runs towards it, treading quickly. As he does so, his outer skin burns, his inner skin burns, his flesh burns, his sinew burns, his bones turn to smoke, and it is the same when his foot is uplifted, he comes out by that door. Immediately next to the great hell is the vast health of excrement. He falls into that. In that hell of excrement, neither mouth creatures bore through his outer skin and bore through his inner skin, and bore through his flesh, and bore through his sinews, and bore through his bones, and devour his marrow. There he feels painful, agonizing, piercing feelings, Yet he does not die so long as that evil, unwholesome action has not exhausted his result. Immediately next to the hell of excrement, the vast hell of hot embers. He falls into them. There he feels painful, agonizing, piercing feelings. Yet he does not die so long as that evil, unwholesome action has not exhausted his result. Immediately next to the hell of hot embers is the vast wood of Simbali trees, a leaf high, bristling with thorns, 16-finger breath long, burning, blazing, and glowing, and make him climb up and down those trees. There he feels painful, agonizing, piercing feelings, yet he does not die as that evil, unwholesome action has not exhausted his result. Immediately he, next to the wood of Simbali trees, is the vast wood of sword leaf trees. He goes into that, the leaf stirred by the wind cuts his hand and cuts his feet and cuts his hand and feet. He cut his ears and cuts his nose and cuts his ears and nose. There he feels painful, agonizing, piercing feelings, yet he does not die so long as that evil, unwholesome action has not exhausted his result. Immediately next to the wood of sword leaf tree is a great river of caustic water. He falls into that. There, he is swept along the stream and against the stream and both along and against the stream. <coughs> there, he feels painful, agonizing, piercing feelings, yet he does not die so long as that evil, unwholesome action has not exhausted his result. Next, the waters of hell put, pull him out for hope and setting him on the ground, they ask him, Good man, what do you want? He says, I am hungry, vulnerable sirs. Then the waters of hell prise open his mouth with red hot iron tongs burning, blazing, and glowing, and throw into his mouth a red hot metal ball, burning, blazing, and glowing. It burns his lips, it burns his mouth, it burns his throat, his stomach, and he passes out below, carrying with it his intestines and mesentery. Then he feels painful, agonizing, piercing feelings, yet he does not die so long as that evil, wholesome action has not exhausted his result. Next, the waters of hell ask him, good man, what do you want? He says, I am thirsty, vulnerable sirs. Then the waters of hell prise open his mouth, great hot iron thongs, blazing, 
burning and glowing, and they pour into his mouth molten copper, burning, blazing, and glowing. He burns his lips, his mouth, his throat, his stomach, and it passes out below, carrying with it his intestines and mesentery. There he feels painful, agonizing, piercing feelings, yet he does not die so long as that evil, unwholesome action has not exhausted his itself. Then the wardens of hell throw him back again into the great hell. It has happened that King Yama thought, those in the world who do evil, unwholesome actions indeed have all these many kinds of tortures inflicted on them. Oh, that I might attain the human state, that at the Targata, accomplished and fully enlightened, might appear in the world that I may wait on that fortunate one, that the perfectly enlightened one might teach me the teachings, and that I might come to understand that fortunate one's teachings. Monks, I tell you this not as something I have heard from another aesthetic or Brahmin. I tell you this as something that I have actually known, seen, and discovered by myself. This is what the perfectly enlightened one said. When the fortunate one has said that, the teacher further said, true, warned by the divine messengers, who many are the complacent, and people may sorrow long indeed, once gone down to the lower world. But when the divine messengers, good people here in this life are warned, they do not dwell in complacency, but practice well the noble teachings. Clinging, they look upon with fear, for it produces birth and death. And by not clinging, they are free in the destruction of birth and death. They reside in joy, for they are safe, and reach the bana, enlightenment, here and now. They are beyond all fear and hate. They have escaped all discontentedness. All right. Thank you, Jan and Donnie. Such a long chapter. I think this might be the longest one that we've had uh, in the book series so far. So what I'd like to do is just kind of open up to any questions that you guys have, because as you see here, there's a lot to discuss, a lot to talk about. So rather than me go through and kind of like I normally do, I'd like to just open up to any questions that you guys might have. Um, yes, sir. On YouTube, Tonka asks, I have a resident that keeps hearing a young girl calling for help. My resident has the beginning stage of Alzheimer's. Could it be someone from hell? It can be, yes. So these different realms can uh, communicate with us, whether it's hell or afflicted spirits or even the heavenly realm. They're formless realms, but they can still communicate with us, just like we talk with other humans, just like we interact with animals, which are in the form realms. We have become accustomed to that, and we see that as kind of a normal thing. Well, the more that you understand about these other realms, then you understand it's very normal for those other realms to talk to us as well and communicate with us. We just tend to not associate it with being normal because they're in the formless realms. But you can see beings in hell, afflicted spirits in heavenly realm communicating with us humans as well. Yes, thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jan has her hand raised. Let's go to her for her question. Thank you, Miranda. Thank you, Teacher David. I, I actually have a couple of questions. Um, Teacher David, is, is it implied here that even Yama and the Wardens of Hell, because of impermanence, could experience a rebirth into a different realm? I didn't look at it that closely, but the answer that I would give you is, is yes, that all of these beings in these various realms are all impermanent. It's not a permanent existence. The Buddha talks about things, uh, beings that are kind of uh, governing these realms or kind of like kind of orchestrating or leading these realms. He talks about, uh, I've seen the Saka of the, the Lord, he calls it the Lord of the heavenly realm. He talks about that being being reborn multiple times. So um, I haven't seen specifically where he talks about these beings being reborn, but as we know, because of the universal truth of impermanence, they would need to be reborn. But there would be another being that comes about in that realm that would essentially fulfill that role that the Buddha is describing. Thank you. I, I think my other question is um, the, if the 
the these are formless realms. The Buddha is talking about these tortures of the physical body. So um, is there so, still some manifestation that would be like a physical body, even in a formless realm? Yeah, if you've ever seen an afflicted spirit, like uh, what we might call a ghost, there's it's formless, you know, there's no physical form there. But in that formless existence, there's the appearance of uh, a human being, for example, in some situations, you can see a ghost or an afflicted spirit that very much resembles what a human being would look like with a head, with eyes, nose, mouth, you know, hands, all these different things that we have, uh, but yet it's just formless. So him describing this is what a being in those realms would appear like, even though they're in the formless realm, if they were able to be seen at different times, like afflicted spirits can be seen uh, by certain people. And on occasion, they're going to have the appearance of what we look like in the human realm. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. So it seems, sir, that it's very important to learn and practice these teachings and if one does not, simply by complacency or wrong view, they could do bodily actions or actions through their speech or their intentions, their thoughts, that could cause rebirth in these hell realms. Is that what uh, is being spoken of here, sir? Yeah, you know, this is where ignorance or the unknowing of true reality is just so detrimental to one's life, because when you don't know, you don't know, right? And um, when you're uh, in that darkness, when you're lacking wisdom, when you have that ignorance or that misunderstanding, that confusion about life, you're not experiencing and understanding the wisdom of things like right view and right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration, then we just don't know what we don't know. And we can very easily experience uh, this realm of hell or animal realm or afflicted spirits because we just don't know. And we're stuck in that darkness. So the Buddha describes as these realms of hell and uh, animal realm, he describes them like a prison. Once you're reborn there, it's very difficult to get out because of the lack of ability to cultivate enough wisdom. It just takes a lot more existences to cultivate that wisdom to move beyond those realms. So we've all ascended at some point from at least animal existences. We've all had countless, countless, countless animal existences. We are now in this human realm. We've done what we needed to do to get here, but the work's not done yet. So if complacency sets in at any point, then we will potentially get reborn into these lower realms. And that's why having the wisdom of things like the three universal truths, the four noble truths, the eightfold path, the five precepts, and all the other things that the Buddha shares that I share in these various programs, this is what's going to get you to contentedness and peacefulness and joy in this life. And you'll be able to see that you're accomplishing that. And here, these things that the Buddha is describing, if you don't have recall of your past lives, you don't have a way to confirm or uh, you know, disprove that these things are true. But all these other teachings that the Buddha shares, like the three universal truths, the four noble truths, the eightfold path, the five precepts and others, you can see that the condition of your mind is gradually improving and you know he was speaking the truth about those. So even though you, someone may not be able to confirm these things, you can understand like, wow, this person with deep wisdom, he didn't just slip in these teachings about the cycle of rebirth in these realms. Like, aha, I gotcha. You know, he spoke such truth and his teachings lead exactly where he says they do to enlightenment, to this peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy. So these teachings that you're learning about in this realms of existence, even though you might not have a way today to independently verify whether these are true, you can 
uh, understand them and take them at face value and just use them as motivation so that you no longer experience those realms ever again in the future. And one of the big takeaways that you see here is the Buddha talking about complacency and how complacency has been so detrimental to this being that is uh, being talked to here. And that as long as there's complacency there, then we're not cultivating wisdom. So the whole path to enlightenment is all about the cultivation of wisdom. And this is where you can see things like rites, rituals, ceremonies, and worship isn't going to lead to an improved rebirth. It's not going to lead you to a heavenly realm it's because you can have all the rites, rituals, ceremonies, and worships that you like. But if your thoughts and your speech and your actions are unwholesome, it's going to lead to rebirth in these lower realms. So it's always about the cultivation of wisdom, which is the direct antidote to transform the mind away from ignorance. And then with that wisdom, the first things you learn is eliminating craving and eliminating anger. And the Buddha gives you the tools of how to do that as part of all of his other teachings. So complacency is so detrimental. Um, and complacency is what will hinder you from accomplishing right view. Right view is understanding the Four Noble Truths and taking responsibility for your feelings. When we have that ignorance or unknowing of true reality, when the mind gets angry or frustrated or annoyed or irritated or whatever discontentedness that it has, we typically will blame other people for it. And right there, it's like being stuck and like trapped because as long as we blame other people for our feelings and emotions, then we're not looking at the true problem. So therefore, we're never going to solve it. It's when you have that breakthrough and understanding the Four Noble Truths and practicing it that you then fully accept responsibility and you see that craving, desire, attachment is truly causing all your discontent feelings that you can actually then actively work to eliminate discontentedness. And that's where you start seeing the real progress when you understand what the real problem is. But as long as that complacency and ignorance is there, we're not going to see the real problem. So therefore, we're not going to get to the real solution. Yes, thank you, sir. You're welcome. Uh, it does not appear there are any other questions at this time. All right, so we'll move to the next chapter, which is chapter 24. <clears throat> Simile of the Lifespan in Hell Venerable Sir, Sariputta and Moggallana have evil, unwholesome desires and have come under the control of evil, unwholesome desires. Do not say, Kokalika. Do not say so, Kokalika. Place confidence in Sariputta and Moggallana, Kokalika. Sariputta and Moggallana are well-behaved. Then for a second time, and yet a third time, the monk Kokalika repeated his words, and a second and third time the perfectly enlightened one advised him with the same words. Then the monk Kokalika rose from his seat, paid homage, respect to the perfectly enlightened one, circled the perfectly enlightened one, keeping the right side towards him, and departed. Then, when the night had passed, the perfectly enlightened one addressed the monks. Monks, last night, when the night had advanced, Brahma Sahampati approached me and said to me, Venerable Sir, the monk Kokalika has died. And because of his resentment against Sariputta and Moggallana, after death, he has been reborn in the Red Lotus Hell. He then paid homage to me, circled me, keeping the right side toward me, and disappeared right there. How long, Venerable Sir? is the lifespan in the red lotus hell. The lifespan in the red lotus hell is long, monk. It is not easy to count it and say it is so many years or so many hundreds of years or so many thousands of years or so many hundreds of thousands of years. Then is it possible, venerable sir, to give a simile? It is, monk. Suppose there was a Kosalan cartload of 20 measures of sesame seed at the end of every hundred years, a man would remove one seed from it. In this manner, the Kosalan cartload of 20 measures of sesame seed might be depleted and eliminated more quickly than a life in a single Abuddha hell would go by. One life in the near Abuddha hell is the equivalent of 20 lives in the Abuddha hell. 
One life in the Ababa hell is the equivalent of 20 lives in the Nira Buddha hell. One life in the Aha hell is the equivalent of 20 lives in the Ababa hell. One life in the Atatha hell is the equivalent of 20 lives in the Aha hell. One life in the water lily hell is the equivalent of 20 lives in the Atatha hell. One life in the sweet fragrance hell is the equivalent of 20 lives in the water lily hell. One life in the blue lotus hell is the equivalent of 20 lives in the sweet fragrance hell. One life in the white lotus hell is the equivalent of 20 lives in the blue lotus hell. And one life in the red lotus hell is the equivalent of 20 lives in the white lotus hell. Now, because he harbored resentment against Sariputta and Mogalana, the monk Kokalika has been reborn in the red lotus hell. This is what the perfectly enlightened one said. Having said this, the, <coughs> one, the teacher further said this. When a person has taken birth, an axe is born inside his mouth, with which the unwise person cuts himself by uttering wrongful speech. He who praises one deserving blame or blames one deserving praise casts with his mouth an unlucky throw by which he finds no peacefulness. Slight is the unlucky throw at dice that results in the loss of one's wealth. The loss of all, oneself included, much worse is this unlucky throw of harboring hate against the holy ones. For a hundred thousand and thirty-six Nira Buddhas plus five A Buddhas, the slanderer of noble ones goes to hell, having defamed them with evil, unwholesome speech and mind. All right. Thank you, Miranda. So the Buddha described a little bit of this in the previous chapter where he was talking about having uh, unwholesome speech towards aesthetics would lead towards this hell because what aesthetics are doing is they're giving up their life of worldly life of a career and possessions and things like this and they're really just pursuing this like life of sacrifice for the benefit of others and helping others of course they have to first do the work themselves and then ultimately they can share the teachings that lead to enlightenment for the benefit of others saraputta and mogalana are two of the buddha's uh, you know, best students, for lack of a better word, you know, they are people who are very dedicated to learning and progressing on the path. The Buddha calls anyone who's deeply learning and practicing noble disciples, because during the lifetime of the Buddha, nobility was determined based on your wealth and how affluent you were in a community. But the Buddha really kind of uprooted that and kind of flipped it on its head and basically started helping people see that nobility is really determined based on your wisdom and your moral conduct and how you function and interact with other people that it's not about where you're born and your uh, ability to have resources and things like this so he called all of his deeply practicing students noble disciples and out of those noble disciples, Sariputta and Moggallana are two that really kind of ascended even above that and just the teachings and helped others to learn how to uh, practice the teachings as well. So here this person was talking uh, in unwise ways about Sariputta and Moggallana and he dies the next day. And this Brahmin shares with the Buddha that, okay, he was born in this red lotus hell. <clears throat> well, one of the Buddha's students ask you know well how long is your lifespan in this red lotus hell so the buddha gives this simile and he talks about i don't I'm not sure i can pronounce this kosalan cartload this is actually a um, location in uh, modern day india it's an actual town or a city and the buddha is basically saying all right this if there is a cartload the size of this city city 20 of them essentially 20 of the size of these cities that were filled with these seeds these seeds are very small little seeds you know a little bit bigger than a sesame seed and he says okay if at the end of every 100 years a man would remove one seed from this cartload um, then essentially the amount of time in this one particular type of hell is longer than it would take to empty that cart of all these seeds um, so that's just an enormous, enormous amount of time. But then the Buddha says, okay, a life in that hell is actually shorter than the life in this other hell. 
Um, and then he goes on and on and on and on and explaining all of that. And essentially, the Red Lotus Hell is the very last one. So it's just this enormous amount of time to exist in this Red Lotus Hell. Today, we tend to think about hell as hell. But during the lifetime of the Buddha, there were multiple hells that they talked about. Same thing with the heavenly realm. We tend to just think of it as the heavenly realm. But you'll hear that the Buddha actually describes multiple aspects of the heavenly realm. Uh, so here there's just this enormous amount of time that this person's going to be in this realm of hell and the buddha is basically saying okay you know let's be sure that we're not slandering uh noble ones people who are you know deeply working towards learning and practicing these teachings because by doing so um having this unwholesome speech um and having this unwholesome mind uh and thoughts about these people then you're just harboring this hate towards people who are practicing this holy way of life. And it's not wise to do that because it's going to end up producing rebirth in the realm of hell for an enormous amount of time. What questions do you guys have on this chapter? Yes, sir. Is this speaking to the importance of developing a mind of loving kindness and also conducting ourselves with right speech so that we are not slandering others sir yeah if you practice right speech the way that i've shared as part of the buddhist teachings which includes the five factors of well-spoken speech you're not going to be slandering uh, anybody let alone aesthetics so um, you will have cleaned this up and you will have no concerns or worries about whether you're going to be reborn in this lower realm of hell. And this is one of the things that happens as you improve your practice related back to the previous chapter where, you know, somebody's sitting around, they're thinking about their life and they kind of feel miserable about all the unwholesome things that they've done. When you're actively working to cultivate wisdom and improving the condition of your mind through improving your practice of something like moral conduct, which includes right speech, and you've been doing that for an extended period of time and you see the results of that, that your personal and professional relationships are blossoming, you'll have no doubt that you're working towards an improved life because more and more people around you are speaking with you in very wholesome ways because that's what you're choosing to do and that's the way you're choosing to speak with others and you will have no worries about ever being reborn in hell because you will have seen the condition of your mind and your life gradually improve that's the beauty of the buddhist teachings is that since they're not based in belief you can see right now in the here and now that your mind and your life is improving and you can set aside any kind of worries about any rebirth in these lower realms as you progress closer and closer and you ultimately get to that first stage of enlightenment from there you'll never ever be reborn into a lower realm and then of course you're going to continue to progress and look to attain enlightenment and know that you're working to do that because you can see the condition of the mind and your life is improving Yes, thank you, sir. You're welcome. It uh, does not appear there are any other questions at this time, sir. All right, so we'll move to chapter 25. <clears throat> yes, sir. Let's go to Rick to read chapter 25, please. Okay. Chapter 25. The hell named the Great Conflagration. <clears throat> Monks, there exists a hell named the Great Conflagration. There, whatever form one sees with the eye is undesirable, never desirable, unlovely, never lovely, disagreeable, never agreeable. Whatever sound one hears with the ear, whatever odor one smells with the nose, whatever flavor one tastes with the tongue, whatever physical object one touches with the body, whatever mental objects one recognizes with the mind is undesirable, never desirable, unlovely, never lovely, disagreeable and never agreeable. When this was said, a certain monk said to the perfectly enlightened one, that conflagration, venerable sir, is indeed terrible. That conflagration is indeed very terrible. <clears throat> but is there, venerable sir, any other conflagration more terrible and frightful than that one? There is, monk. But what, venerable sir, is that conflagration more terrible and frightful than that one? Those ascetics or Brahmins, monk, 
who do not understand as it really is. This is discontentedness. This is the cause of discontentedness. This is the elimination of discontentedness. This is the way leading to the elimination of discontentedness. They excite in volitional formations, choices and decisions, that lead to birth in volitional formations that lead to aging, in volitional formations that lead to death, in volitional formations that lead to sorrow, grief, pain, displeasure, and despair. Now, exciting in such volitional formations, they generate volitional formations that lead to birth, generate volitional forms that lead to aging, generate volitional formations that lead to death, gener generate volitional formations that lead to sorrow, grief, pain, displeasure, and despair. Having generated such volitional formations, choices, decisions, they are burnt by the conflagration of birth, burnt by the conflagration of aging, burnt by the conflagration of death, burnt by the conflagration of sorrow, grief, pain, displeasure, and despair. They are not freed from birth, aging, and death, not freed from sorrow, grief, pain, displeasure, and despair, not freed from discontentedness, I say. All right. So here, the Buddha is essentially sharing how, yes, there's a place that's worse than this great conflagration in hell where there's nothing that is desirable, uh, nothing that's lovely, nothing that's agreeable. It's all uh you know undesirable unlovely and disagreeable and he describes that as being unknowing of true reality being ignorant of the four noble truths that if somebody was ignorant or unknowing of the four noble truths then this is worse than being in hell because essentially you're still trapped right you're still going to continue to experience discontentedness over and over again it's not until you understand the four noble truths that you can have that breakthrough understanding what the true problem is and then actually eliminating it so as i was discussing earlier is that as long as there's that unknowing of true reality whether you're in this realm or any other realm, then you're continuing to experience continuous discontentedness and you'll never, ever, 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 ever fix the problem because you don't know what the problem is or that there even is a problem. So by learning the Four Noble Truths and having that breakthrough, the Buddha is saying that, okay, you know, this is where you can actually make improvements in your life. But because there's this lack of understanding, this lack of wisdom of the Four Noble Truths, then there's still this excitement in choices and decisions or volitional formations that continually lead to birth, aging, and death, this sorrow, grief, pain, and displeasure, this discontentedness. As long as the mind is making decisions to chase after these temporary pleasant feelings, this excitement, then that choice to chase after those pleasant feelings is going to lead to continued birth, aging, death, and this sorrow, grief, pain, displeasure. But it's when you understand the real problem through the Four Noble Truths that the mind is having craving, desire, attachment, chasing after these pleasant feelings, wanting them to be permanent, but yet basing them on some impermanent condition. Then you understand what the real problem is, is your mind's own craving, desire, attachment, having these pleasant feelings, painful feelings, and feelings that are neither painful nor pleasant. And that's where you can actually solve it. And you can actually get to the point where you are free from birth, aging, death, and sorrow, grief, pain, and displeasure. That's what an enlightened mind is going to experience, is that it's free of discontentedness. It's peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy, but you're making the choices to actively move the mind in that direction through practicing the Eightfold Path, which includes meditation, but also includes other things as well. What questions do you guys have on this chapter? <clears throat> um, yes, sir. On YouTube, Tonka asks, if we do good in the world just for the selfish reason of not going to hell, would it be wrong intention? Would that bring us to hell for that reason, sir? Not necessarily. Um, you know, you would be interested to improve your conduct because it's a wise thing to do. Understanding that 
one of the benefits of doing that is that you won't experience these lower realms that can be motivation encouragement but ultimately by the time you get to the point where you're not going to experience these lower realms which is the first stage of enlightenment as a stream enterer as you progress through those uh, phases you're not going to be doing things out of selfish desires you're going to be doing things because you know it's the right thing to do Yes, thank you, sir. You're welcome. Uh, it does not appear that we have any more questions at this time, sir. All right, so we'll move to the next chapter, which is 26. <clears throat> Go to Jan to read chapter 26, please. Thank you, Miranda. The hell named the contact sixfold base. Monks, there, it is a game for you. It is well gained by you that you have obtained the opportunity for living the holy life. I have seen monks the hell named contact sixfold base. There, whatever form one sees with one the eye is undesirable, never desirable, unlovely, never lovely, disagreeable, never agreeable. Whatever sound one hears with the ear, whatever odor one smells with the nose, whatever flavor one tastes with the tongue, Whatever physical object one touches with the body, whatever mental objects one recognizes with the mind is undesirable, never desirable, unlovely, never lovely, disagreeable, never agreeable. It is a game for you monks. It is well gained by you that you have obtained the opportunity for living the holy life. All right. Thank you, Jan. So the Buddha explains this in other teachings where he talks about kind of valuing this human existence because it's in this human realm which is the perfect realm to attain enlightenment in the hell realm animal realm and afflicted spirits realm it's impossible to attain enlightenment in those realms you can still you know gradually make your way towards the other realms but it takes a lot of work a lot of effort to do that there's this constant rebirth in the existences in those realms are so long but ultimately getting to the human realm it's ideal because you experience pleasant feelings painful feelings and feelings that are neither painful nor pleasant so we oftentimes have the motivation to move the mind towards an improved condition because we're experiencing those uh, pleasant feelings, painful feelings, and feelings that are neither painful nor pleasant. Those painful feelings and feelings that are neither painful nor pleasant tend to motivate us um, along and saying, you know, gosh, we really want to get rid of this anger, this sadness, or this frustration, this despair, this displeasure. Because in the heavenly realm, they can attain enlightenment from there, but they only experience pleasant feelings. They're experiencing happiness, excitement, elation, thrill, euphoria, those kind of feelings. So they tend to be very complacent there. So here in the human realm, we can evolve the mind. We have the ability to do that. We can cultivate wisdom. We can improve the condition of our mind. And oftentimes the motivating factor is when we're experiencing painful feelings or feelings that are neither painful nor pleasant. So that's what the Buddha's uh, pointing to here is that, you know, really value this human life and don't be complacent and really use it to your advantage to cultivate the mind and get to uh, this peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy, this enlightened mental state. And while there'll be challenges and difficulties and struggles along the way, as you progress and as you ultimately get to enlightenment, you will thank yourself for all that work that you did to actually get there. What questions do you have on this chapter? Um, it does not appear we have any questions at this time, sir. All right, we'll go to chapter 27. Yes, sir. Let's go to that answer, chapter 27, please. The suffering of bondage. So too, monks, when one does not have confidence in cultivating wholesome qualities, when one does not have a sense of moral wrongdoing in cultivating wholesome qualities, when one does not have moral concern in cultivating wholesome qualities, when one does not have energy in cultivating wholesome qualities, when one does not have wisdom in cultivating cause qualities, in the noble one's discipline, one is called a poor, impoverished, needy person. Having no confidence, no sense of moral wrongdoing, no moral concern, no energy, no wisdom in cultivating wholesome qualities, that poor, impoverished, needy person engages in misconduct by body, 
speech and mind, this, I say, is his getting into debt. To conceal his bodily misconduct, to conceal his verbal misconduct, to conceal his mental misconduct, he nurtures an evil, unwholesome desire. He wishes, let no one know me. He intends with the desire, let no one know me. He speaks statements with the desire, let no one know me. He makes all the endeavors with the desire, let no one know me. This, I say, is the interest he must pay. Well behaved, fellow monks speak thus about him. This vulnerable one acts in such a way, behaves in such a way. This, I say, is his being advised. When he has gone to the forest, to a foot of a tree, or to an empty dwelling, evil and wholesome thoughts accompanied by remorse attack him. This, I say, is his prosecution. Then with the breakup of the body after death, that poor, impoverished and needy person who engaged in misconduct by body, speech and mind is bound in the prison of hell or in the prison of the animal realm. I do not see monks, any other person that is as terrible and harsh and such an obstacle to attaining the unsurpassed quality for bondage, enlightenment, as the prison of hell or the prison of the enemy animal realm. Poverty is called discontentedness in the world, so too is getting into debt. A poor person who becomes indebted is troubled while enjoying himself. Then they prosecute him and he also incurs imprisonment. This imprisonment is indeed discontentedness for one yearning for gain and sensual pleasures. Just so in the noble one's discipline, one in whom confidence is lacking, who does not see danger in wrongdoing and ruin, keeps up a mess of evil, unwholesome dharma. Having engaged in misconduct by body, speech and mind, he forms the wish that no one finds out about me. He twists around with his body, twists around by speech or mind, piles up his evil, unwholesome deeds in one way or another, repeatedly. This unwise evil the world, knowing his own misdeeds, is a poor person who falls into that trouble while enjoying himself. His thoughts then prosecute him Painful mental states born of remorse follow him wherever he goes, whether in the village or the forest. This unwise evil doer, knowing his own mistakes, go to a certain animal realm or is even bound in hell. <coughs> this indeed is the discontentedness of bondage from which the wise person is free. All right. Thank you, Donnie. There's actually quite a bit that the Buddha is talking about here in this particular discourse. Uh, first, he's talking about having confidence, right? These, he's talking about, of course, someone who doesn't have these things, but let me phrase it in a way that will help you, is that you know you need to have confidence in cultivating these wholesome qualities. At different times in your practice, you might lack confidence, and that's normal as you're progressing. But ultimately, what you would like to do is build up this confidence that you can cultivate these wholesome qualities and work towards an improved way of life through gaining the wisdom of these teachings. And you would like to have this sense of moral wrongdoing. What a sense of moral wrongdoing is knowing right from wrong or wholesome from unwholesome. <coughs> if you lacked wisdom of the teachings, you wouldn't know what is wholesome and unwholesome. You wouldn't know things like the five precepts, or you wouldn't know that it was wholesome to have uh, mindfulness or awareness of mind, or that it's wholesome to have concentration. You wouldn't know these things. So what the Buddha is doing as part of his teachings is helping you to understand what's wholesome and what's unwholesome so that you can develop this sense of moral wrongdoing that you know right from wrong, so to speak. And then you develop this moral concern. What moral concern is, is that you have the concern of doing what is wholesome and that when you do unwholesome things, you have this concern that, yeah, this is going to cause me difficulties in my life. This is going to cause struggles and, and difficulties in this life. And if I don't improve this, it's going to cause me difficulty in other lives, too, because this craving that I have and these a lack of wisdom that I have, this ignorance, it's going to just continue in this life and in future lives. So let me have this concern to clean this up. Now that I know right from wrong in terms of what's moral and what's wholesome 
and unwholesome because I have this moral wrongdoing. Now let me have this concern to clean up my conduct and make it better. And then have the energy to actually do that, that don't be complacent and just, you know, be indifferent about the lack of wisdom or the lack of moral uh, wrongdoing and or your lack of moral concern. Instead, let me apply the energy in cultivating these wholesome qualities of mind that I now know about and recognizing that there's a lack of wisdom or this ignorance or unknowing of true reality. Let me apply the effort and energy to cultivate this wisdom and cultivating wholesome qualities. That's what you would like to ultimately cultivate in your practice along with other things. Because if you didn't have confidence, you didn't have moral wrongdoing, you didn't have moral concern, you didn't have energy, and you didn't have wisdom, the Buddha is saying this is what's called a poor, impoverished, and needy person in his teachings and in his discipline. Because with a lack of any of these things, you would find it very difficult to make improvements in your life and in your life practice. And now, with that lack of moral wrongdoing, this lack of confidence, this lack of moral concern, this lack of energy and uh, lack of wisdom, then this person is essentially getting into debt. You know, that means that as you continue to do unwholesome things, you're continuing to generate unwholesome karma, and you're going to have to burn all that stuff off. You're going to have to end up improving all of that. So the more and the longer that you're doing unwholesome things, it's just more that you're going to have to get into debt because you're going to ultimately have to burn off those unwholesome things that you're doing in life. And then as you're doing that, you might have experienced times in your life where you were looking to conceal what you were doing, your bodily, verbal, and your mental conduct. Maybe you were, you know, you knew enough about uh, moral wrongdoing that you knew you were doing wrong and you're kind of trying to hide it from other people. And this is problematic as well. And the Buddha is saying this is like paying interest on a loan that you have to continually hide what you're doing, right? Nobody is interested in doing that. So when you start learning these things and you start to learn how to improve this so that you're not getting into debt and you're not paying this interest anymore. And then as you improve your conduct, that's where you will see that you'll have this improvement in your life. And this is um, how you can get advice from a teacher and guidance from someone who's guiding you and how to improve your conduct and improving your wisdom, improving your mental discipline. This is what will really help you because if you don't do those things and you're not improving your conduct, what the Buddha is basically saying is that when you're alone and your thoughts are attacking you and helping you to see the unwholesome things that you're doing this is like you being prosecuted by your own conduct so if you're experiencing that now it's normal uh, for someone who's lacking this wisdom but the buddha is showing you how you can improve this and you can get better and how these experiences that you're having where maybe you're being bombarded by these unwholesome thoughts and you're feeling remorse for the things that you've done in the past this is like you being prosecuted, your own prosecution for the unwholesome things that you've done in the past. This is part of our unwholesome gamma. We oftentimes view the unwholesome results of our decisions or unwholesome gamma as going to jail or paying a penalty or something like this. Or, you know, these are like worldly things that happen. But the unwholesome gamma that you experience is, is above and beyond that. Even the unwholesome thoughts and the remorse that you experience. Um, as a result of the things that we've done in the past, this is uh, the mind experiencing the unwholesome results of our decisions or the unwholesome gamma. That is also the results of our decisions. So the Buddha is encouraging his students here to get out of this debt, to no longer uh, continue to experience this debt of going into uh, and practicing these unwholesome things, but instead get out of this discontentedness so that you don't experience these things any longer. And by eliminating this misconduct by body, speech, and mind is how you do that. And it's the eightfold path that is going to help you learn how to do that. Let's see what else is in here. Yeah, so once somebody is experiencing discontentedness or as you're experiencing discontentedness, this is the mind being bound up. 
it's stuck it's not liberated it's not free but when you cultivate this wisdom that's when the mind is free because now when you understand why these things are occurring because of craving anger and ignorance or the unknowing of true reality now you can take exact steps to actually eliminate it but without the wisdom of how to actually learn and practice this path then you're going to continue to experience discontent as the mind is bound up it's trapped right it's suffering so by eliminating the pollutions of mind of craving anger and ignorance purifying the mind then this wise person having gained this wisdom is now free the mind is liberated it's liberated from discontentedness it's no longer experiencing anger sadness frustration irritation annoyance guilt shame fear boredom loneliness shyness resentment jealousy and all these other discontent feelings what questions do you guys have on this chapter <coughs> it does not appear there are any questions at this time sir all right we'll go to chapter 28 a few in hell to be reborn among human beings or heavenly beings what do you think monks which is more a little bit of soil in my fingernail or the great earth venerable sir the great earth is more the little bit of soil that the perfectly enlightened one has taken up in his fingernail is insignificant compared to the great earth the little bit of soil that the perfectly enlightened one has taken up in his fingernail is not calculable does not bear comparison does not amount even to a fraction so too, monks, those beings are few who, when they pass away from hell, are reborn among human beings. But those beings are more numerous who, when they pass away from hell, are reborn in hell, in the animal realm, in the realm of afflicted spirits. For what reason? Because, monks, they have not seen the four noble truths. What for? The noble truth of discontentedness, the noble truth of the cause of discontentedness, the noble truth of the elimination of discontentedness, the noble truth of the way leading to the elimination of discontentedness. Therefore, monks, an effort should be made to understand, this is discontentedness. An effort should be made to understand, this is the cause of discontentedness. An effort should be made to understand, this is the elimination of discontentedness. An effort should be made to understand, this is the way leading to the elimination of discontentedness. What do you think, monks? Which is more, the little bit of soil in my fingernail or the great earth? Venerable sir, the great earth is more. The little bit of soil that the perfectly enlightened one has taken up in his fingernail is insignificant. Compared to the great earth, the little bit of soil that the perfectly enlightened one has taken up in his fingernail is not calculable, does not bear comparison, does not amount even to a fraction. So too, monks. Those beings are few who, when they pass away from hell, are reborn among the heavenly beings. But those beings are more numerous who, when they pass away from hell, are reborn in hell, in the animal realm, in the realm of afflicted spirits. For what reason? Because, monks, they have not seen the four noble truths. What for? The noble truth of discontentedness, the noble truth of the cause of discontentedness, the noble truth of the elimination of discontentedness, the noble truth of the way leading to the elimination of discontentedness. Therefore, monks, an effort should be made to understand, this is discontentedness. An effort should be made to understand, this is the cause of discontentedness. An effort should be made to understand, this is the elimination of discontentedness. An effort should be made to understand, this is the way leading to the elimination of discontentedness. All right. Thank you, Miranda. So previously, the Buddha was talking about how long an existence is in this realm of hell. Well, now what you can understand is not only do beings in hell experience that existence in hell for this exorbitant amount of time, but it's frequent that those beings are then reborn in hell again or in the animal realm or in the realm of afflicted spirit so it's not like you go to hell for a short little bit and then you pop right back to the human realm although beings in hell 
can be reborn into the human realm and can be reborn into the heavenly realm, the Buddha's explained that that's very rare, that it doesn't really occur very frequently. And the reason why is because they don't understand the Four Noble Truths. It's the Four Noble Truths that explains to us the problem, the cause of the problem, the elimination, and the complete elimination. So that is a teaching that the Buddha points to regularly throughout his teachings, that that is the breakthrough, that once you understand the Four Noble Truths and you start practicing it deeply, you can really make real progress on the path to enlightenment. Without understanding that teaching, you would find it very difficult to make any real progress on the path to enlightenment. So that's where I will typically start with a brand new student is with the Four Noble Truths. And that's where uh, potentially you started as well. And if you're not yet understanding that teaching, it's very important to deeply understand the Four Noble Truths. The best place to start would be Volume 1, Chapter 4. Um, and then there's classes that I've taught on that, and there's even short videos. I've done a short video series uh, that are very uh, short kind of mini lessons to help you learn the Four Noble Truths and develop that breakthrough. And that's what's going to ultimately help you create improvement in this life, because that's what's going to explain the problem, the cause, the elimination and the way leading to the complete elimination of discontentedness. And having done that, having eliminated discontentedness, not only are you living this peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy in this life, but then you're no longer experiencing rebirth. So you're essentially getting a two for one deal here. So if you like two for one deals, that's a really good one to get. What questions do you guys have on this chapter? It does not appear there are any questions at this time, sir. All right. So chapter 29. Yes, sir. Let's go to Rick to read chapter 29, please. <clears throat> okay. Um, so other darkness greater than the blinding darkness in the world of dreadful regions. Monks, there are world interstices vacant and dreadful regions of blinding darkness and gloom where the light of the sun and the moon so powerful and mighty does not reach that darkness venerable sir is indeed great that darkness is indeed very great but is there venerable sir any other darkness greater or more frightful or more, more frightful than that one there is monk but what, venerable sir, is that darkness greater and more frightful than that one? Those ascetics and Brahmins, monk, who do not understand as it really is, this is discontentedness. Who does not understand as it really is, this is the cause of discontentedness. Who do not understand as it really is, this is the elimination of discontentedness. Who do not understand as it really is, this is the way elimination of discontentedness they excite in volitional formations choices decisions that lead to birth in volitional formations that lead to aging in volitional formations that lead to death in volitional formations that lead to sorrow grief pain displeasure and despair exciting in such volitional formations they generate volitional formations choices decisions that lead to birth generate volitional formations that lead to aging, generate volitional formations that lead to death, generate volitional formations that lead to sorrow, grief, pain, displeasure, and despair. <clears throat> Having generated such volitional formations, they tumble into the darkness of birth, into the darkness of aging, they tumble into the darkness of death, tumble into the darkness of sorrow, grief, pain, displeasure, and despair. They are not freed from birth, aging, and death, not freed from sorrow, grief, pain, pleasure, and despair, not freed from discontentedness, I say. But monk, those ascetics and Brahmins who understand as it really is, this is discontentedness. This is discontentedness. Who understands as it really is, this is the cause of discontentedness. Who understands as it really is, this is the elimination of discontentedness. Who understands as it really is, this is the way leading to the elimination of discontentedness. They do not excite in volitional formations, choices, and decisions that lead to birth, 
and volitional formations that lead to aging, and volitional formations that lead to death, and volitional formations that lead to sorrow, grief, pain, displeasure, and despair, free from discontentedness, I say. Therefore, monks, an effort should be made to understand this is dis discontentedness. An effort should be made to understand this is the cause of discontentedness. An effort should be made to understand this is the elimination of discontentedness. An effort should be made to understand this is the way leading to the elimination of discontentedness. All right. Thank you, Rick. So here the Buddha is now describing not knowing the Four Noble Truths is like this great darkness, this blinding darkness, right? This dreadful world, more dreadful than the one that they're describing here in terms of hell, because to continually experience discontentedness over and over and over again and not know why and not know how to fix that, that is such darkness. The mind is trapped that the mind is so unknowing of true reality or so ignorant or so misunderstanding, having such misperceptions that it's in this darkness of continuing to experience discontentedness over and over again because it doesn't understand what it doesn't understand. That's what it feels like to uh, not know the Four Noble Truths. And when you ultimately broke through to understand the Four Noble Truths, perhaps you felt like you've been living in darkness your whole life. And getting through that, now you can walk towards the light and eliminating the unwholesomeness in the mind and purifying the mind. So the Buddha is explaining not knowing the Four Noble Truths is this deep darkness. So focusing on those and improving your understanding of those and being sure that you're practicing those all the time is very, very important. What questions do you guys have on this chapter? It does not appear we have any questions at this time, sir. All right, so now we're gonna move into discussing chapters of the animal realm. In today's class, we just have one chapter related to that, but then next week we'll have additional chapters. <clears throat> To reappear in the company of animals. Monks, there are animals that feed on grass. They eat by cropping fresh or dried grass with their teeth. <coughs> and what animals feed on grass? Horses, cattle, donkeys, goats, deer, and any other such animals. An unwise person who formerly excited in flavors here and did evil, unwholesome actions here, on the dissolution of the body after death, reappears in the company of animals that feed on grass. There are animals that feed on dung. They smell dung from a distance and run to it thinking, we can eat, we can eat. Just as Brahmins run to the smell of a sacrifice thinking, we can eat here, we can eat here. So too, these animals that feed on dung, smell dung from a distance and run to it thinking, we can eat here, we can eat here. And what animals feed on dung? Fowls, pigs, dogs, jackals, and any other such animals. An unwise person who formerly excited in flavors did here and did evil actions here. On the dissolution of the body, after death, reappears in the company of animals that feed on dung. There are animals that are born, age, and die in darkness. And what animals are born, age, and die in darkness? moths, maggots, earthworms, and any other such animals. An unwise person who formerly excited in flavors here and did evil actions here, on the dissolution of the body after death, reappears in the company of animals that are born, age, and die in darkness. There are animals that are born, age, and die in water. And what animals are born, age, and die in water? fish, turtles, crocodiles, and any other such animals. An unwise person who formerly excited in flavors here and did evil actions here, on the dissolution of the body, after death, reappears in the company of animals that are born, age, and die in water. There are animals that are born, age, and die in filth. And what animals are born, age, and die in filth? Those animals that are born, age, and die in a rotten fish, or in a rotten corpse, or in a rotten porridge, or in a cesspit, or in a sewer. An unwise person who formerly excited in flavors here and did evil actions here, on the dissolution of the body after death, 
reappears in the company of animals that are born, age, and die in filth. Monks, I could tell you many ways about the I could tell you in many ways about the animal realm, so much so that it is hard to finish describing the discontentedness in the animal realm. All right. Thank you, Miranda. So here, this particular chapter is essentially equating conduct that we have here in the human realm to what leads to rebirth in the animal realm. And the Buddha is going to talk more about that, just like he did with the hell realm. There's going to be chapters here that help us to understand things that lead to rebirth in the animal realm. And the goal would be to um, you know, get out of that whole cycle of rebirth where you're no longer experiencing that. So you can take these uh, chapters and you can look at the side that would avoid that. So if the Buddha is explaining here that a unwise person who formerly excited in flavors and did evil, unwholesome actions is going to lead to rebirth in animals, then your would be wise to not excite in flavors, meaning flavors through the tongue. And you would be wise to improve your moral conduct where you're not having unwholesome actions. And that's what's going to help you to get to enlightenment. It's also going to help you to avoid rebirth in any of these lower realms. Here, the Buddha talks about, or at least mentions, um, how Brahmin during his lifetime were actually doing animal sacrifices as part of their practices. And that's something that you can just kind of keep in mind because he has this relationship with Brahmin because Brahmin are essentially trying to help people to improve their life, but they're not quite understanding the teachings of how to do that fully. There are certain things that Brahmin are practicing that are very much uh, in line with the Buddhist teachings, but then there's other things that they do that aren't in line with the Buddhist teachings. So he mentions these Brahmins and he mentions about re being respectful towards them, but at certain times he kind of mentions how they're not really practicing teachings that would necessarily lead to an improved life. And here's one of those situations where he's explaining that, or at least mentioning it. What questions do you guys have on this chapter? Yes, sir. Rick has his hand raised. Let's go to him for his question, sir. <clears throat> Thank you. Hi, Teacher David. Um, as we were reading this, this very delightful kitty cat started rubbing herself against my legs. And um, I was thinking about her, that she's a domesticated animal. And she's very affectionate with the other cats. And I've only seen her to be kind and um, gentle in her disposition. Is it possible uh, that there are some animals who are born into a certain animal realm that have the potential for uh, maybe being born into the human realm because their suffering is not as great, that their karma is not as, as, as horrific, or I guess you could say? Yeah, so all beings that are in any of these realms, they're ultimately going to be moving in and out of these different realms. So any animals that exist today, they will ultimately most likely make their way, you know, towards the human or heavenly realm with opportunities to attain enlightenment, or they might have been human in the past, and now they're down in the animal realm and making their way back up to that realm. So this is one of the reasons why we see the explosion of the human population is that now because of this closeness between animals and humans, which isn't necessarily always the best and ideal, but we do have a lot of domesticated animals that are taking on more and more wholesome qualities that didn't necessarily exist in other times in history. That now with the domestication of animals and them having more wholesome uh, disposition or more wholesome conduct, they have a, a very high likelihood of being reborn into a higher realm like a human realm or heavenly realm in their next rebirth. So it's not that... Uh, that this being your cat um, is necessarily uh, doomed to be in this animal realm for the rest of their existences. But all these existences uh, that we see, both in the human realm, heavenly realm, and all the others, the lower realms, these are all impermanent. These are all uh, beings that are coming and going. The Buddha describes it as roaming and wandering in and out of these various realms. Um, so as we have animals that we might have in our homes and stuff and they're learning uh, better ways 
and they're no longer having to fight for their food. They're no longer having to kill for their food. They're no longer having to steal for their food. You may even um, have a situation where they're no longer having sexual misconduct or any sex at all. This is all helping them to improve the condition of their mind and uh, experience a potential better rebirth in the future. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, it does not appear we have any more questions at this time, sir. All right. Well, thank you all for uh, those of you who volunteer to read today, those of you who are learning and practicing, those of you that are learning ahead of time and coming to class with questions. I appreciate all your diligence and your determination to learn these teachings to help you, those close to you, and all of humanity. It's really wonderful to be able to go through the Buddhist teachings as detailed as we are in this program, starting with volume two, now we're in volume 11, and we're gonna just continue forward through the rest of the volumes. And once we get to volume 13, which is the last book, we'll end up just restarting over again. So we have about another six months left in this program, and we're then gonna actually just be restarting all over again. So next week, we're going to be in chapters 31 through chapters 40, which is the next 10 chapters. You're welcome to read these prior to class. Uh, if you don't have time to do that, of course, you're always welcome to come to class and you'll be able to continue to learn um, and grow with us because we read these chapters in class. But if you did some reading on your own and you came to class, that's gonna be the most ideal. And I suggest about 10, 15 to 20 minutes of reading per day. That's what kind of slowly trickles the teachings into the mind and then allows you to gradually practice them as you're learning them gradually each day. It gives you time to reflect on them, think about them and gradually implement them into your life. So that's what I would suggest going forward. And it would be chapters 31 through 40 that we're gonna focus on next week in this class. Tomorrow is the group learning program, and we're gonna be in volume one, chapter 11, which is devoted to developing your meditation practice. So there I'm gonna go through and teach you uh, in a very detailed way all the various aspects of meditation to help you further develop your practice. And then this Wednesday, Miranda is going to be uh, sharing a class on breathing mindfulness meditation. It's going to be a Zoom only quest, uh, class. So if you're used to live stream and uh, learning through Facebook or YouTube or the other places that we live stream to or the podcast, if you would like to participate and learn in the meditation class, you would need to join by Zoom, which Miranda will be there uh, teaching you guys this week. So thank you all for your questions. Thank you all for reading. Thank you for everything you're doing to bring these teachings into your life. I really appreciate that. And you should be seeing the improvement to the condition of your life and the condition of your mind as you're doing that. Feel free to reach out for guidance, whether that's in the Facebook group, whether it's uh, sending a private message, whether it's asking questions in these online classes or scheduling a personal guidance session, please to help you guys in class and outside of class as well. Just let me know what questions you have and I'd be pleased to help you. So we'll see you in a future class. Have a very lovely and wonderful rest of your day. Take care. Sawadee 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 Thank you, sir.
thank you again for watching. Enjoy your meditation. Look forward to seeing you online and answering any questions that you might have. Thank you so much. Thank you.